sense of humor. All right, got it. All right, good evening, everyone, and happy 2022. We're back here with a, another full year of Rev War Revelries. Um, I'm joined today by Chris White, uh, who is the Deputy Director of Education for the American Battlefield Trust, and also a um, great friend of ER, ERW and Chief Historian of Emerging Civil War. I think I've got all your titles uh, there, Mr. White. And also Dan Davis, also of the American Battlefield Trust, ECW. He is the uh, education manager for the trust there. So uh, thank you both gentlemen for joining us here on the first revelry of 2022. Happy New Year to you both. Um, and so today we're going to talk about the pivotal battle of Calpen, since we're actually coming up on the anniversary here in what, about eight days or so, um, on January 17, 1781. One of the uh, most pivotal battles of the American Revolution. Uh, definitely turns the tide in the very... Um, climatic uh, Southern campaign of the American Revolution. Um, but the, it does not happen in a vacuum. There's a lot of events precluding it that leads to Morgan and Tarleton uh, squaring off there in Northwestern South Carolina. So to put it in context, I'm gonna kick it over to Chris White to get us started here. All right, thanks, Phil. Uh, we appreciate you having us. The ERW does a lot for uh, the American Battlefield Trust. If you have, head over to battlefields.org, you can see a lot of different uh, content pieces that we have from uh, various authors from uh, emerging Revolutionary War. So uh, great partners. Hopefully later this year, we'll be able to get out in the field, do some videos with them. Um, so we'll see. We just got to make sure we keep them sober while, while we're out in the field because it always seems like it turns into a, a drinking contest. Um, and uh, just so everyone knows, I'm drinking water this evening and uh, not Dang. getting in with all the revelry. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm following along here on uh, on Facebook. So if you're wondering why I'm looking off to the side, I'm, I'm checking out what's going on. So, um, you know, before we, we get down to the battle itself, I, I like to go from the, you know, the 50,000 feet down to 500 uh, feet. Um, so let's get everyone oriented to, to where we are. And um, this is Google Map. Um, to give you an idea, we're going to work with some of the American Battlefield Trust at, uh, maps. Uh, you can check out those at battlefields.org. They're all free. You can download those. Later this year, we'll have a uh, volume of Revolutionary War maps that are coming out. Um, they'll come out probably in March or April. Supply chain issues are pushing everything back. They were supposed to be out a little bit earlier, um, but you'll be able to follow through our maps um, the American Revolution. Um, and some of the battlefields that we'll be covering are obviously down here in the south. Uh, but the Calpins battlefield um, sits just outside of Greenville, North Carolina. Um, it's near Charlotte. Charlotte's actually covered up here by a visitor center that you see here. Um, but uh, Charleston, which is down at the bottom of the map here towards the bottom center, um, that's going to become important here in uh, 1789. We'll talk about that here in a second. But to give you an idea, Calpins is going to be in an area um, that's that's close to Spartanburg, close to Greenville. Um, Kings Mountain, the Battle of Kings Mountain that straddles the North Carolina, South Carolina border is technically here directly south of where you see Kings Mountain. You go directly south, you'll find that there. Charlotte's just over into this uh, area, not the big city that it is today at the time of the Revolutionary War. If you move up off into this direction, you'll find Greensboro. This is off to the northeast. Greensboro is the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, which will be um, two months, almost two months to the day after the battle here at Cowpens. Uh, but the armies will make their way uh, up towards Danville, up towards the Dan River, up into Virginia, and then fall back towards um, Greensboro after Cowpens. So this will be our operational area. We're looking at the entire state of North Carolina. Um, we're going to be taught, looking down into South Carolina. So this is a big operational area. Um, and it's going to come in the wake, the Battle of Cowpens will come in the wake of the Battle of King's Mountain. So let me uh, pop over to a, another map for you real fast. Um, and this will be our Southern Campaigns uh, map that you can go over and check out. Steve Stanley created this for us. Um, this is over at battlefields.org. It's going to show a lot, but not all of the actions in the Southern Theater. Um, the Southern Theater is really going to be the hotbed of action uh, from late 1778 all the way up through uh, 1782 into 1783. Uh, but to get from the 50,000 down to the 500 uh, feet level, um, what ends up happening in the North turns into roughly a stalemate. Um, we'll have, you know, 
George Washington's victory at Boston. Then we'll have the British take New York. Um, then we'll have those 10 crucial days of Trenton and Princeton um, and Washington's crossing. And then we'll move into 1777 and Philadelphia falls to the British. But uh, at Saratoga, we have that victory uh, with Horatio Gates and his army, um, which is going to bring the French into the war on the side of the Americans. And after a while, once this turns into essentially a small world war, another war of empire, um, and you can learn more about that in our latest edition of Hollowed Ground over at battlefields.org, um, you're going to start to see uh, that the, the British Empire is going to start to focus on different areas. Not only are they going to stop focusing so much on North America, they're going to start looking at the Caribbean. They're going to have to deal with Gibraltar um, because it'll be a long siege there. You're going to start seeing problems over in India for them. So this turns into a minor world war. And the British start to kind of look at this map down here. They start to look at Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia. And they say to themselves, you know, there are things produced here in the Southern colonies that we can't produce in any other part of the British empire. So we're going to be looking at rice, indigo, tobacco, um, you know, things you can't produce in the Northern colonies. So a guy named Charles Jenkinson is probably the, the mastermind initially behind this idea of, hey, let's go into the South and, and cut the South off from the Northern and Mid-Atlantic colonies. And if we have to sue for peace, you know, they're coming to the realization that they might not win this war. If we do this uh, with having these Southern colonies under our thumb, we'll be in a very strong economic position where if we cut, cut these out, we'll actually still have these colonies here um, in North America. And remember, only 13 of the British colonies are rebelling here in North America, as well as in the Caribbean and other places. You know, uh, Barbados is actually the, the richest of the colonies here uh, for the British. But, you know, 13 have risen up. So maybe we can keep on to Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia. So eventually they come up with the idea that they're going to start sending armies um, towards Savannah and Georgia. There'll be uh, Savannah will fall to the British and then eventually the Americans will try to besiege it. Um, doesn't go well. That army will fall back to Charleston, and that is where the British will start to focus a lot of their efforts. Um, Henry Clinton, the overall commander in North America for um, Great Britain, is going to lead an expedition himself down to Charleston, and he'll besiege the city. Once Charleston falls to the American or to the British, um, it'll be the largest surrender of American forces during the war, and it is also going to be you know the richest port in the South falling into British hands. Remember. Great Britain's projection of power is the Royal Navy. Their army is strong, but their Navy is even stronger. So if they now have, they have New York in their hands, they have Charleston in their hands, these are two major ports. They had Boston at one point, they had Philadelphia at one point. But what they can't seem to do is project their power into what we would call the back country. We can take Charleston, but man, now we have to get out into the back country. We have to get out towards um, the Piedmont and, and from the Piedmont out towards the mountains. And this is where they're going to start running into some problems because this is going to turn into a war of outposts because we're going to have to supply our armies from Charleston, move things into inland at places like 96, uh, which you've probably heard of, places like Camden. Um, and this is how we're going to start to establish outposts and then slowly, slowly uh, be able to maybe make our way up into North Carolina, uh, which is actually kind of against orders. But uh, nonetheless, the British start to, they take Charleston, they start to move into the back country. And the war changes precipitously for them uh, because in Charleston, there was the elite elite class and then some of the people living in the back country are like ah that's their fight you know if charleston falls that's fine but once the british army started moving into their backyards into this back country that's whenever it turns into a civil war in a civil war um, where neighbors who are loyalists are going to start taking on neighbors who are patriots and it really turns into a very ugly war in this back country um, and eventually uh, the continental congress will send a new commander to the south benjamin lincoln had to surrender his army at charleston next thing we're going to do is send a guy named horatio gates to the south um, and this is probably the guy george washington wanted no he wanted another guy named nathaniel green but they get Gates. Gates, he's won the Battle of Saratoga. He's brought the British, the French in on the side of the war for the Americans. So here comes Gates. He comes down here. He leads a campaign, and he is defeated at Camden. Within 97 days, two American armies were, uh, were basically wiped off the map within 97 days. So, man, this, things aren't going well in the South. 
But eventually, Charles Cornwallis, who takes over command in the South, starts moving his men on a three-pronged approach towards North Carolina. And his westernmost prong will meet its woe at a place called King's Mountain. It's led by Charles Ferguson, or I'm sorry, um, Patrick Ferguson. Ferguson uh, is going to say a lot of bad things about the Americans, and he's going to get a lot of people riled up and uh, men will come literally over the mountain from t- the Tennessee area of today to defeat him. And at King's Mountain, that's really going to put a, a damper on the British. But nonetheless, Charles Cornwallis, even though he's not ordered to, and he's really not authorized to, is eyeing up the American army that is just north of the uh, North Carolina, South Carolina border, now under the command of Nathaniel Green. After the Gates' is defeat at Camden, on October 2nd, Continental Congress authorizes, or October 14th, maybe, um, the Continental Congress authorizes General um, Green to be sent to the south. And on December 2nd, Green arrives in the area around what we call Charlotte today. Um, and Green is going to decide, in the face of a superior force, to split his army into more than one piece. Um, and he's going to send a column into South Carolina under the command of a guy named Daniel Morgan. I'll let Dan Davis talk about Daniel Morgan. Um, and he is going to be tangling with that, that, uh, that guy that everyone loves to hate. And it's Bannister Tarleton, 26 years young at the time of this battle. Um, you know, he's not called Bloody Ban during the war. He'll be called that after the war, but most people know him as Bloody Ban. Um, and he had fought at a place called Waxhaws earlier in 1780, and it's going to be uh, known as Buford's Massacre, or it's also going to be known as Tarleton's Quarter, uh, because allegedly Tarleton is going to order the, the execution or a massacre of the American forces there. So we now have a new, uh, we have now have a new overall commander in the south for the americans nathaniel green we now have a very aggressive commander moving into south carolina named daniel morgan going on to take who's in his mid-40s going to take on one of the most aggressive commanders in the british army bannister tarleton and it's going to be an epic match um and it's one for the ages uh chris uh we got a question that came in uh it's a good time to pose it for you why was gates selected to command the southern army at first rather than general nathaniel green Basically, it's a lot of politics. Um, there's a, a new book that, that's out about Saratoga. Well, it's newish. Um, Kevin, I'm looking at my bookshelf. Is it Complete Victory? Is that the yeah, one? Yeah, Kevin Weddle uh, oh. did it. And he really does a really good job of, of dissecting Gates. John Moss also does a nice job in his Guilford um, courthouse book about dissecting Gates. Uh, but Gates is very much playing the political game uh, with the Continental Congress. Continental Congress is split between Gates Washington, and at one point, Charles Lee. Lee's, though, out of the game after Monmouth. Um, so really, it comes down to politics. Um, Gates is a guy who has proven he can win. So, you know, he's a British commander. He, he, he formerly served in the British Army. So he's, he's a seasoned veteran. He's won Saratoga, and he's politically savvy. Um, you know, did he always get along with, with his subordinates? Absolutely not. Um, but this is a guy who's proven that he, that he could win. Green uh, is technically outranked by Gates. So even though George Washington wants Green to go to the South, Green is ranked by Gates. And Green, you know, he's an interesting choice because Green has been, he's not a professional soldier. He's joined up at the beginning of this war. He's learned on the job. Um, you know, he's made his mistakes at Forts uh, Washington and Lee, um, you know, but but he is uh, and he's been the quartermaster at Valley Forge. So this is a guy who knows how to feed an army. He knows how to march men around. He knows to f- how to fight in the field. So he is Washington's backing. But at, at the end of the day, um, it's more going to be seniority and the fact that Gates is, you know, politically more savvy to, to come down here. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great answer and uh, kind of sets the scene. Okay, so now one of Gates's major um, motivated or lasting influences is actually getting Daniel Morgan uh, kind of back into the fold. So I'll pass that over to Dan and he can take us into the Cowpens. Yeah, so Daniel Morgan is one of the more uh, obviously interesting individuals to come out of the American Revolution and the Revolutionary War era. He is the quintessential rough and tumble frontiersman who lived on the uh, outer reaches of society, if you will, in the 18th century. But he's also a veteran soldier. He's a veteran of the French and Indian War. He fought during Benedict Arnold's campaign, again, uh, the Canadian campaign at Quebec, where he's uh, injured, he's captured, eventually exchanged, plays a very important role in the battles of Saratoga. But 
he goes home. He ends up resigning his commission. He's essentially miffed over being passed over by promotion. And when Gates receives command of the Southern Department, uh, Gates and Morgan are neighbors. Uh, Gates lives uh, near modern Shepherdstown uh, in West Virginia. Morgan is, uh, he, he's a neighbor just a few miles down the road in Battletown or modern Berryville, Virginia. And Gates and Morgan meet in Berryville prior to Gates leaving for the Carolinas. And Gates essentially tells Morgan that he's going to bring him back to command, but Morgan's not going to come back. Obviously, he's still miffed at the Continental Congress, probably to, at George Washington to a certain degree. He's not coming back unless he gets his Brigadier General star. So Gates says, I will do everything I can possible. Morgan says, OK. Morgan sits tight for a little bit until word comes of the disaster at the Battle of Camden, August 16th, 1780, when Gates is summarily defeated by, as Chris mentioned, by Charles Cornwallis, uh, sends the Americans uh, retreating back into North Carolina, opens the way for Cornwallis himself to extend the British uh, power in the Carolinas, marching into North Carolina. Uh, and I really admire Daniel Morgan for this because without a command, I mean, really without a commission, he gets in the, back in the saddle and he rides south to join Gates's army he will eventually receive his promotion to brigadier general and when green takes over command he relieves gates in december of 1780 green decides to keep obviously he's a new commander uh with the new army he decides to keep daniel morgan on which is a, a, probably a, may have been one of green's most important decisions as a commander in the south but even more so as chris mentioned when green decides to divide his army uh he does it really out of necessity his men are, again, this is the American army that has been defeated at Camden. They're in a pretty poor state. Uh, Charlotte has been picked over by the Americans, by the British. And Green essentially decides to organize what's called a flying army and put it under uh, Morgan's command. He has command of uh, militia, state troops, continental regulars, as well as dragoons. And Green is going to take the bulk of his army to the area around Sherrod, North Carolina, where then he decides to send Morgan west into the Carolina backcountry. And he gives Morgan several, he issues a set of orders to Morgan where he gives Morgan's instru Morgan instructions to obviously collect as, and forge as much provisions as you can to spirit up the people and to threaten the British outposts in western South Carolina, particularly as far as Charles Cornwallis is concerned at 96. Now, Morgan moves into the backcountry, eventually takes up a position at Grindle Shoals along the Pacolette River. And this is really, his presence is really alarming to Cornwallis because Cornwallis is, I think, to a certain degree, is thinking back to the previous fall when he, after he's carrying the initiative and in the wave of success from Camden, he invades North Carolina. He sends Patrick Ferguson into the backcountry. Ferguson is summarily defeated at Kings Mountain. And Cornwallis loses his left flank. He's forced to withdraw back into South Carolina. And for Cornwallis, he sees yet another Patriot, a Continental Force, operating on his left flank. And he can't have that. Um, he's concerned about the security of 96. So he dis dispatches his most aggressive and probably his most uh, reliable subordinate Bannister Tarleton, he's a lieutenant colonel, uh, had served uh, going back to 1775. He uh, had attended Oxford uh, very briefly, bought a commission in uh, the King's Dragoon uh, Guards, participated in uh, the first British attempt to take Charleston in the summer of 1776. Uh, most famously, as Chris mentioned, Charles Lee. Uh, Tarleton participates in uh, Charles Lee's uh, capture in New Jersey toward the end of 1775, but he's eventually commissioned and given command of, or ultimately takes field command, I should say, of the British Legion, which is a unit made up entirely of loyalists recruited from the northern colonies to serve in the British Army. He has a very ruthless, uh, fearsome reputation, and when Cornwall dispatches Tarleton, he gives uh, to, uh, to uh, engage Morgan. Uh, he gives uh, Tarleton very, uh, they're very simple, very explicit orders. Essentially, he's to find and defeat Morgan, uh, no matter what the cost might be. Once Tarleton confirms that Morgan is not a threat to the outpost at 96, he then takes off directly after Morgan. Uh, Morgan eventually withdrawing from his position at Grendel Shoals, slowly northward toward Island Ford on the Broad River, 
Morgan hopes to um, ideally get across the Broad River, put a, uh, a river in the middle of winter between himself and Tarleton, who's coming on very, very uh, quickly with his uh, mixed unit of uh, infantry and mounted uh, troops. And, more, and Tarleton is, I mean, he's literally pushing his men to the limit. Uh, Morgan, at the same time, realizes that he's not going to, this is around the afternoon of January the 16th or so, he's not going to be able to reach Island Ford. Tarleton has closed the gap. Morgan decides that he's going to uh, stand and make a fight at a rolling meadow called the Cow Pens. And it's called the Cow Pens because it was utilized by the backcountry settlers in the colonial days uh, uh, for herding their cattle before driving them to market in Charleston. It's a long rolling pasture, uh, ideally suited for not only ca open cavalry movement, but infantry movement as well. And if you get a chance to visit the Cowpens National Battlefield today, it's outside Gaffney, South Carolina, uh, you're going to see essentially what Morgan and Tarleton saw on the morning of January 17th, 1781 as a very well-preserved battlefield. Yeah, and I would just add that everybody wanted Morgan. Um, you know, if, if you had the opportunity to get Morgan, you wanted him. Uh, Washington, you know, who I think some people forget, you know, he is the, the overall commander in chief of the Continental Forces. So, you know, he is he has a, a job of sending troops to the south. He could send troops to the north, you know, um, farther north because he's up in the, in the northern area. Uh, but, you know, in 1777, especially everybody wanted Morgan. You know, it, it, they're requ he's requesting him and his riflemen um, uh, to come along after Quebec and and he's in other battles. He's proven himself to be a, a capable commander. Um, eventually, you know, his, his probably his most famous actions will, will come at Quebec and Saratoga before Calpens. Um, So, you know, that's that's the person that every everybody wanted. That's the unit they wanted. His Virginia and Pennsylvania riflemen um, get them on the field, you know, and and. Morgan's a guy who doesn't have much of a military background. I mean, he, he served in the French and Indian War, but, um, you know, that was as a, as a teamster and, um, you know, nearly cost him his life because of the lashings, you know, 500 lashings that he was, he was basically given a death sentence, but survives it. So, you know, this is, this is a, a, a combat veteran who um, everybody wants to have on their side if you're on the continental side. Isn't it uh, true though, Chris, that he, they only gave him 499 whippings. They miscounted uh, Daniel Morgan said that he owed one more to the British. I had heard that. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's, I don't know, a lesser man definitely would not have survived what he went through. Yeah, purportedly, that's what Morgan said, and he's going to get his opportunity to pay one back, Calvin, if he hadn't already at Saratoga. It's a devil of a whipping. What can we say? Yeah. <laughs> I was feeding that one to you on a silver platter there. Um, but uh, so a uh, question. Uh, so if it's great for Calvary, uh, the cow pens, then no. Uh, why, how, why is, how does Morgan going to counteract that? Isn't he facing, uh, isn't Tarleton Calvary? Isn't he facing Calvary at the Calpens? Yeah, go for it, Dan. Yeah, he is. Uh, Tarleton has a mixed force. He's got, uh, seven, uh, he's got the 17th Light Dragoons um, as well as the 7th uh, Regiment of Foot. He's got his own British Legion Infantry along with British Legion Cavalry in the 1st Battalion of the 71st Regiment of Foot of Fraser's Highlander. So, Tarleton, obviously, he is a cavalryman, but he's commanding these light troops, and he has them moving very, very quickly. And Morgan knows he's coming on quickly, and Morgan's going to decide to, he's going to formulate a battle plan that's going to utilize Tarleton's over-aggressive and turn it, over-aggressiveness and turn it against him. Uh, he knows that the British are going to, uh, they're going to uh, show up in the field worn out, cold, tired horses are going to be tired or Morgan's had an opportunity that night, the night before the battle really to rest his men. His men have had a hot meal. They've spent the night around campfires and Morgan's going to utilize again, Tarleton's aggressiveness, aggressiveness against him. Yeah. And I, I'd, I'd throw in there that I think that from a higher standpoint, um, from a higher level standpoint, that the, the British high command did not understand the war in North America, specifically those over in London. Um, you know, they really only send two British cav units here. I think it's the 16th and the 17th. And that's it. That's what they have to operate with. So everything else you see coming along will be these these loyalists um, that are they're put together. You know, so if you, you see, you know, Tarleton and his green 
you know, kind of dragoon outfit, that's also denoting he's, you know, leading the King's own loyalist regiments from like New York, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, other places. Um, so not only are you bringing in Cav that's, that's, you know, not professional, you're also bringing him in from a whole different part of the colonies who don't really know this back country all that well. So, and this is supposed to be your eyes and ears and, you know, behind the Royal Navy, you know, the, the Cav that's in um, the, the army at, the British Army, or you know, that's that's kind of their elite force. Um, when we think of the charge of the Light Brigade at Balakalva um, during the Crimean War, I mean, that's that's the British Cav. Um, so it's interesting to see that they only commit really two true regiments here for the duration of the war. Great point. And so they have this mixed bag of force coming, and then Morgan obviously uh, it plays the what's the strength of Morgan's forces at, at the Calpens, Dan. What's interesting about Calpens is that, uh, that both sides, uh, given I think some of the most recent scholarship, it's a pretty, uh, it's a fairly even battle. Both sides have roughly, give or take, about a thousand men that they're going to put into the field between 800 and a thousand, given uh, the returns and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's the, the both sides, Morgan and Tarleton, are going to be evenly matched during the battle. Yeah, I mean, the only thing, the only advantage really that that uh, Tarleton has are, are two cannon, two yep. light three pounders. Um, and really, let's be honest, it's more for morale than anything on this size of a battlefield, which, you know, the Calpins is roughly 500 yards wide, 500 yards long. Um, it's open. So, you know, it just basically comes down to what every rev war and almost every battle comes down to timing. Um, you know, when do we launch our attack? When do we launch our counter attack? And as we'll see that, that, it was mismanaged on the, the British side and it was managed very well on Morgan's side. Um, and it also just comes down to leadership. And I think that the, the leadership um, in this case, you know, under John Eager Howard and, you know, the, the Delaware, Virginia and Maryland Continentals um, is that backbone. And, and of course, William Washington and Daniel Morgan, um, I think that definitely outshined what Tarleton was bringing to the field. And that's some of that leadership is even the night before the battle. I mean, Morgan under giving the role. I mean, militia um, have a haphazard record in the uh, in the Southern theater. I mean, for the, we always remember with Camden where they break quickly, or uh, in other uh, battlefields where they don't hold up as well. But it's actually also militia or irregular forces that keep the light of the American uh, presence after Waxhaws and. Um, and Camden, there's not my continental presence in the state of South Carolina. So it is this militia, but now you have this militia again, and they're with Morgan. And uh, do you want to talk, Dan, about the, the two lines? There's three lines, but two of the lines are primarily militia. Yeah, the, as Phil mentioned, the night before the battle, after arriving at the Calpens, Morgan's going to take stock of the situation. He's going to form his uh, come up with a battle plan. And he's going to, uh, and as Chris is pulling the map up, on the screen, he's going to form his men into three successive lines. Uh, the first line is going to be made up of riflemen from Georgia, the Carolinas. Uh, the second uh, line is going to be made up of South Carolina, predominantly South Carolina militia under the command of Colonel Andrew Pickett's. Uh, an excellent choice for command, a veteran of uh, the Indian warfare and on the South Carolina frontier, veteran of the American uh, revolution. Uh, but he's going to backstop that militia. As, as Phil mentioned, uh, the militia has, and some American commanders have a very poor view of the militia. And he, Morgan's going to backstop them with his Continental regulars. And what's interesting about these, the Continental regulars, the, the Marylanders, the Delawares under Captain Robert Kirkwood, uh, Virginians under Francis uh, Triplett, uh, some of the Virginian militia, I believe, also on that third line with uh, John Edgar Howard, Robert Kirkwood also had some Continental Army, regular Army uh, experience. But uh, to talk real quickly about the Marylanders and the Delawares, Morgan has something. If he owes a lash to the to the British, uh, you could make a good argument. So did the Marylanders and the Delawares. These are the remnants of Gates's army that had been that had fought that so well despite the militia uh, running at. Camden. Uh, these are the consolidated or what's left of the consolidated first and second Maryland brigades and as well as the Delaware regiment as mentioned under Robert Kirkwood. These guys, they're also looking for some payback along with Morgan. 
But the general idea is to backstop the militia with the regulars. And Morgan's plan later becomes known as a defense in depth. He's going to delay Tarleton's advance as much as possible and inflict as many casualties as possible, wearing down the British while those first two lines of the riflemen, the militia, would draw back to the main line. And, and it's at the main line that Morgan, in an ideal situation, would strike a fatal blow to a worn out and to a further worn out and depleted force under Tarleton. So when you have the, the three lines, um, there are some questions coming in um, about the militia. Um, we've kind of covered that there. Um, the uh, We'll get to a few other questions about the British cavalry at a, a different time because they'll interrupt the flow uh, here. But so with January 17, 1781, Tarleton's coming on the field. It's, um, it, it is morning, correct? And um, his men have pretty much pushed through the night to get there, a uh, very early start on uh, the night of 16th and the 17th. So they arrive and what do they see? If, if people have not been at Cowpen's battlefield. They come up, can they see the three lines that are in front of them? No, uh, Tarleton, when he arrives on the field, it's still dark. Um, the, fighting, uh, the fighting between Morgan's pickets and the vanguard of the British force starts well before daylight. I would like about 5.30, 5.45 or so in the, Morgan, uh, in the morning as Tarleton is approaching uh, cow pens. And this is sporadic firing uh, until Tarleton reaches the field. He encounters the first line of the riflemen from Georgia, from the Carolinas. Uh, those riflemen fire, given, depending on the accounts that you read, they fire a few volleys. But what they force Tarleton to do is it's it, – for Tarleton that morning, it's the first organized resistance he's actually run into beyond the pot shots from the pickets and from the skirmishers. So what it forces more or Tarleton to do is deploy a battle line. And once he deploys that battle line, that's when those riflemen pull back to join Pickens and the South Carolinians in the second line. Tarleton shakes out a battle line. From his point of view, he can only see – Pickens in the militia as he's moving somewhat uphill, although I would encourage everyone, if you haven't done so, visit Calpens. The, the terrain there is very deceptive. But Tarleton can only see the South Carolinians as he shakes out that battle line and sends uh, his men forward. Yeah, and he has his guys up at 3 a.m. They're on the march. Once he makes contact, he rushes his battle line. Um, he rushes to deploy them as quickly as possible. Um, the, the seventh isn't even deployed fully whenever the line goes forward. I mean, it's, it's going to be as quickly as humanly possible. He's, he's going to go. And, you know, that's the aggression that a young commander is going to show. Um, he's going to leave the 71st, the first battalion of the 71st Highlanders in reserve. Um, and I mean, you know, some people I've seen kind of question that if, the, if they should have been put in the front line because they were one of the best uh, units to kind of drive people from the field. Eventually, they'll get on, onto the battlefield. But the third line that that um, he has deployed, that Morgan has deployed, is in a reverse slope position, uh, meaning that it's actually slightly behind a ridge line. So that's going to give them more cover and concealment. Um, and, you know, that's going to make it just that much harder for Tarleton to, to locate. Um, and reverse slope positions are something that the British Army used throughout most of their history. So it's kind of ironic that they, they get it kind of the tables turned on them. Yeah, and Tarleton is also operating under really the same mindset as many of the American commanders. He has a high contempt for the American militia. And he sees the American militia running to him. That's Waxhaws all over again, uh, 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 as well as Camden all over again, although there were that many militia at Waxhaws. But the idea in his mind is there. The Americans are running. I now have the initiative. I need to press the attack forward as quickly as I can. And as he presses forward the attack, um, there is a little bit of a confusion actually in that third line, right? I think uh, Howard starts to, to move uh, misconstrued order, if, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, do, you, do you want to talk about that? Eventually. Can we talk about oh. the second line first? Oh, about, sorry, I didn't mean to jump line. One, two, <laughs> then three. Yeah, we got to get, <laughs> get there. We got some cab action too, uh, sprinkled in between. 
I told you he's into this cab action stuff. I wasn't oh, yeah. really yeah, started. Yeah, yeah. All right. So you want to talk second line or cab action, Dan? Let's, 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 go, the let's go to the second line. Uh, Georgia, South, the Carolinians, they, uh, the Georgians, the Carolinian uh, uh, riflemen, they would draw back to uh, Pickens' line. They join Pickens' line. Tarleton is then pushing forward to the second line. Pickens is under orders given by Morgan the night before for fire. And it depends again on the account that you read two to three shots. Let's just say there's probably two to three shots fired by the second line and the second line withdraws. They begin pulling back toward again, the main line, the third line on that reverse slope. And that really, um, that really, it inspires Tarleton if you're banished to Tarleton. I've pushed through one line. I've pushed through another line. I'm now going to send my cavalry, the 17th Light Dragoons, into that mass of retreating militia to utilize what cavalry is supposed to do in the 18th century. After, line, after infantry lines break, cavalry is typically committed to rake havoc, uh, run down fleeing soldiers, and uh, really uh, be used as a psychological weapon amongst retreating uh, troops. But as the 17th goes forward, Morgan sees that his cavalry commander, Lieutenant Colonel William Washington, distant relative of George, commander of the Third Continental Dragoons, he sees that. And then the Third Continental Dragoons ride out from a, really a, probably a bowl ravine area, an area that Tarleton can't see. They slam into the 17th and they completely break up the charge of the 17th. And then Washington smartly is able to keep control of his men. He pulls back, it reins up his horses and then pulls back to assume another position behind that third line of continents. But nonetheless, even with the repulse of the 17th, the British line continues forward. And we're not talking about a ton of calf that's going no. forward. It, these are small units with the 17th, well, about 50 guys mounted at this point. Um, yeah, I think it, Washington. It's, it's about the same with Washington. Yeah, and and he got a few few extra militia who kind of joined up with his <laughs> dragoons, uh, who are now dragoons all of a sudden. Um, you know, it, going forward, so don't don't get the idea of this mass cab charge going back and forth, which it was. I mean, it was it, probably cool to watch these these guys, mm-hmm. but we're not talking about hundreds or thousands of of horsemen meeting um, at this full charge. And and the, the other thing about the second line pulling back. Um, you know, there's been some question over the years of, you know, how did they actually go? Some people think that they went to the right or the left kind of to get out of the way. Um, there's other accounts of them actually falling back through the ranks. Uh, they actually, the, the Continentals opened the ranks so that the militia could go through them and rally behind. And that's where Morgan will be at some point uh, trying to get Pickens men, men rallied behind that third line, which is his stone wall in a, in a way, as you, if you will. So there's a lot of moving parts. It's a, I mean, this is a fast battle. Um, you know, it's going to take us longer to describe it than this battle is going to actually take place in, in real time. So now, so the cavalry is Washington's cavalry is out. Uh, he's a distant cousin, of course, of George. We uh, stay with that. There is the cavalry. The second line is going around. And now um, how many minutes have we looked from initial contact now through the second line? Maybe 20 to 30. Yeah, as Chris mentioned, this is a fast moving battle. This battle lasts probably no longer than an hour. And yeah. so they come up on this um, and the reiterate could uh, we just had a few people join asking, what is the, the third line? So they're coming up on the third line. That is um, can you uh, re- reshare that for us, Dan. Yeah, the third line is made up of what's left of the Maryland brigades under the command of uh, John Edgar Howard the Delaware Regiment commanded by Captain Robert Kirkwood, as well as some uh, Virginia uh, militia, which I mentioned earlier, I believe some of those Virginia militia actually had continental regular service um, as well, uh, commanded by uh, or one of the individuals uh, who's commanding the Virginia, the Virginia is a fellow named Frank Triplett, Francis Triplett. Um, but this is, these are considered to be Morgan's. These are the best troops in Morgan and in Green's army for that matter. These are the seasoned, Continental regulars. And as the British approach the line, it's time for the Continental regulars to get into the fight and they pay them back for Camden. Uh, they unleash a withering volley into the British, um, into the British ranks that, uh, and the two sides essentially stop and they trade volley for volley in the open field. This prompts Tarleton now with seeing his line uh, brought to a halt. He sends up 
the seven, the first battalion, the 71st on his left flank in order to reinforce the line, but ideally flank the third position to Howard's position. And this is what uh, Phil, what you alluded to the 71st comes up and as they begin deploying on the left, the, one of the rightmost companies on Howard's line, uh, has to refuse the line. They bend the line back at an angle so they don't, their, their position isn't physically flanked. But as they do that, it creates a ripple effect and the various companies on down the line then have to redeploy. They actually, the, the Continentals, uh, interestingly enough, they actually about face and begin withdrawing but they're withdrawing uh, not only under fire, but they're doing it as if they're on the parade ground. They're doing it very calmly. Now, Morgan is back in the rear attempting to rally the militia. He sees this and he believes uh, that his line is giving way. So he rides up to John Eager Howard. He's mounted. Howard is mounted. And he asks Howard, you know, essentially what is going on? Or why are the men retreating? And Howard points to the men and says, uh, in, in the words of this effect to Morgan, uh, have you ever seen troops retreat in such uh, fine order? He explains to Morgan what has happened. Morgan uh, then rides back to the rear and he chooses a position from which the line, that withdrawal, that redeployment will stop. The men will face about and they will unleash a volley. On the other side of the lines, Tarleton sees this uh, redeployment and he misinterprets it uh, essentially uh, the same way that Morgan did. He thinks the Continentals are retreating as does the rest of the British line. The British line break ranks, uh, they lose their momentum, they lose their cohesion uh, in a bayonet charge. But then Morgan reaching the spot, he gives out the order, he says something along the lines of face about men, one good fire and the victory is ours. Howard's Continentals joined by the rallying militia, they then face about, they unleash one volley and, that, uh, and after that essentially all hell breaks loose. That volley completely cripples the advancing British troops. And Howard is going to order a bayonet charge. He's going to order a counterattack. And Morgan's plan, uh, his, the ideal situation for Daniel Morgan, uh, comes true. He strikes the fatal blow at his third line. Men launch a counterattack, slamming into the British position. And the British, the, the British retreat very, very quickly becomes a rout off the field. The British soldiers, those who do not surrender initially, they're running for their lives. Yeah, and there, there's a lot of similarities here between Guilford Courthouse, which takes place two months later, um, especially on the third line. I mean, you know, Green sets his line up very similar fashion um, at Guilford Courthouse, and very similar things happen on that third line where they're trying to redeploy in the face of an enemy. And it doesn't go as well at Guilford Courthouse, but here at, at um, Calpens, I mean, Morgan is, is right there on the spot. Um, you know, basically, Tarleton's going to go in for the kill. You know, he sees this third line starting to, to fall back. And so the 71st Highlanders try to take the initiative and they start surging forward. And it's about that timing. Um, we we're talking about Dan, like Dan said, they start launching into this bayonet charge at the time that they have unloaded muskets and they're going to, you know, just be ready with that bayonet and that then it's going to be the volley that staggers them. And then Morgan launching his counterattack on both flanks as well as the center of Tarleton's force. Um, and he's going to catch them right at the right place, right at the right time. Um, and if you read Morgan before the battle and you read Morgan after the battle, it's interesting to see his interpretations of what his plan was and what it evolved into. Uh, but regardless, uh, luck definitely played into here. And definitely there was a, a lot of good timing and a lot of skill uh, on the side of the Americans. That's luck. Um, I think it's a little after this, Napoleon once uh, would say that luck is better on a battlefield than skill at some sometimes. Um, paraphrasing Napoleon, who of course came later. But this is one of the most successful but double involvements in American history. Um, does it, do we do you know whether uh, how successful is there another precursor to a double involvement? Can I? Yeah. <laughs> it got real for the romans <laughs> yeah uh, hey, that's the, that's the original <laughs> so so i mean it's a very i mean it's a almost a i don't want to say complete victory but a very uh, um it's a lucky skilled 
devastating victory. And um, so how are the British able to escape? I mean, does Tarl Tarleton obviously makes it out, but the ones who have not been there, uh, why isn't the Americans more successful? Well, you see double embellishments in other places uh, before K or after Cannae, but those are that's what a lot of people kind of go back to with, with this thing. Um, and Cannae is a, a battle between the Romans and between the Carthaginians during the Second Punic War. Um, and basically, it is the perfect battle whenever it starts on, on a grand scale. And that's what people start saying about Morgan's battle here. Um, you know, we'll see double embellishments at Pickett's Charge. Pickett's Charge is actually a double embellishment at the end. Um, the, the Union forces sweep in from the north and from the south. South and they start to envelop the, the Confederates essentially attack into a box. We'll see the same thing in the Falaise Gap. Uh, Hitler has one of the, the largest double envelopments in Kiev, where he captures 650,000 uh, um, uh, Russians. So when you look at this battle, it's not as big. But it's very impressive what these Americans were able to do, um, because they're essentially eliminating the left flank of uh, Cornwallis's force for the second time in about three months uh, because Ferguson was that left flank and he was eliminated at Kings Mountain. And now for the second time, essentially since Kings Mountain, we've eliminated that left flank uh, or that left hook that Cornwallis wants to use to move up into North Carolina, get out of South Carolina and, and keep that, that campaign moving. So I think the elimination of the army is important. Dan, you can get in a little bit more of what happened on, on the ground, but um, what Morgan was able to accomplish out here, I think, plays into the fact that the British, time and time again throughout this war, underestimate the Americans' abilities, um, you know, and overestimate exactly what they're capable of doing, um, meaning the British themselves. You know, the British have won a lot of victories, but, you know, it's a war of attrition. This is not a war of annihilation. This is a war of attrition at this point. Um, so, you know, Green, Morgan, Washington, they can win by not losing. Um, and that's how Green's going to win, win the war in the South. Uh, but Morgan here wins a victory, and that's one of this, this attrition. And it's going to help take nearly a thousand British uh, soldiers off the mark or off the books. Dan? Yeah. Morgan inflicts 75% casualties on Tarleton's force at Cowpens. Uh, given that a fair number of that 75%, a large percentage of that percentage are captured British soldiers. But they're captured British soldiers, as Chris said, in a war of attrition that Cornwallis, although he has reinforcements coming, these are from some of his best units, the 71st, uh, 1st Battalion, the 71st, the British Legion Infantry, uh, the British Legion Cavalry are chewed up at Calpens. And in addition to that, it complete, it maintains the initiative for the Patriots, for the Continentals in the South. It serves as a follow-up victory, as Chris mentioned, to, to King's Mountain. And by winning at Cowpens, Morgan maintains the initiative in the South squarely, squarely with the Americans. And it will now be Cornwallis who has reacted to Morgan's presence in the backcountry. Now Cornwallis is going to have to react to this stunning defeat and a defeat upon, again, his most capable, arguably, subordinates at Calpins. So the initiative is squarely uh, in the lap of the Americans at roughly about noon on January 17th, 1781. So you're looking at, the, I mean, the British... Um... I mean, the majority is captured so over 600. Some, uh, I think, are offensively netted by the Americans, but it's a victory. But then he's now kind of wrestled up a hornet's nest, right? Cornwallis uh, realizes that the American army is now detached, correct? They're in two different, and he's going, and so Morgan's going to have to leave the field shortly uh, after the victory on January 17th. Um, where's he, where's he going? So well, he's Morgan, gonna, it, sorry, sorry, Dan. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I was going to say, so this kind of goes into where what Morgan kind of says before the battle and after the battle, like I, I was going to fight there. And then he's like, I wasn't going to fight there. And then he also says something like, well, you know, I wanted to have a river to their backs, but also have an escape route. And he's like, I didn't want to have, I wanted to have a river to our militia's back so that, that they couldn't escape. You know, so you, you start to have to read between the lines here and there. But um, Morgan has to pull back um, up into North Carolina. That's this is going to be the next step. Um, you know, he's overextended. He's like you said, kicked up a hornet's nest. Um, and this 
will start into the early phases of what will eventually become the race to the Dan River. Um, you know, the two armies by uh, a month from now, or just about a less than a month from now, February 9th to 10th, they'll be up around Guilford Courthouse for the first time. They'll come back there a month later. Um, but what this really turns into is uh, Green having to fall back towards uh, Virginia uh, because, you know, there's a lot of politics at play. Um, some of the governors of these colonies don't want their militia fighting outside of their borders. Some of these militia guys come out for one battle and go home. They're like, hey, I did, did what I was supposed to do. I'm out of here. Um, so there's a lot about going back into timing. There's a lot of timing. So at this point, Green's army is starting to dwindle. We've seen the loss at Charleston. We've seen the loss at Camden. Um, we've had the wax saws. Yeah, we've had victory at, at Kings Mountain, but a lot of those soldiers went home. They came out for one battle went home and 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 that was one of morgan's worries here at, at, at calpets was that if i don't stand and fight here if i go north of the broad river these guys are all going to go home and and i'm not going to have an army to stand and fight with and tarleton might catch up with me um so a, a lot of that gets into it so what ends up happening is morgan himself goes home ironically um he heads back to, to virginia i mean he's in ill health he's been in ill health through through a lot of the war you know, his, his service in the French and Indian War didn't do him any, um, you know, any favors. Then he goes up and fights in Quebec, which was just a hellish campaign. Um, you know, he, he's captured, eventually he comes back, fights at Saratoga, other places. This is a guy who's, who's hell's catching up with them. Um, and so he he's going to head off the, off of the, the scene. Um, and it really falls on the shoulders of green Johnny Gear Howard and, and other soldiers there. So, and Cornwallis, I think at this point has reached a frustration level. Um, and Dan, you can feel free to speak to this of, I think he's just, he's ready to land the killing blow and never can. And he comes so close time and again. And I think that's the frustration that leads him into, into North Carolina. Now this has been on his, his mind since Camden, right before Camden, he's already talking to Clinton about going to, to, to North Carolina. Um, so now that, you know, he's had two ugly defeats out there in, in the Western um, South Carolina, if you will, right there on the North Carolina border too, at Kings Mountain here at Calpins, it's time for him to go of go for broke, go into North Carolina. This turns into the race to the Dan. Um, he's dragging along a bunch of his of, of continental prisoners, which is going to slow him down. He decides to burn his wagons mm -hmm. and baggage, which is just an idiotic move. Um, and Green outfoxes him at every turn um, and is available able after about 10 days in, in Virginia after he wins that race to the Dan River to swoop back into North Carolina lose at Guilford Courthouse, but still it'll be a Pyrrhic victory for those British who lose 26% of their forces. Sorry, Dan, I went off on a tangent. Oh, no, I want to go back to something you alluded to earlier. Uh, Green, remember, that one of the reasons why Morgan is in the backcountry is that uh, simply because of the poor condition of the Continental Army in late 1780 that Green uh, inherits. And Green realizes, even with this victory at Calpens, my men who've been in this camp of repose, as he calls it, around Shara, they're still not ready to fight. They're still, uh, they're still resting, uh, gathering, foraging uh, for supplies. And Green realizes, even, you know, as Chris mentioned, the militia coming and going, he's still not in a position, again, despite Morgan's victory at Calpens, he's still not in a position to take Cornwallis on. And it's going to be a while. And that's what precipitates what's known as the race of the Dan. And that is getting to the safety of Virginia and essentially uh, turning the war of attrition into or the campaign of attrition into a campaign of exhaustion. Green knows he can't fight Cornwallis uh, in an open battle, but he knows that his uh, units are, number one, lighter. They can travel faster. Number two, more uh, again, Green, the old quartermaster of the Continental Army, has put up stores and supplies at various magazines throughout North Carolina that his men can rely upon as they withdraw further into North Carolina that Cornwallis just won't have access to. And they're going to be moving over a country that's been picked to pieces by both armies. So Green, to a certain degree, does have, uh, he, did, he has the advantage, uh, he has the initiative, but he also has a few other advantages working in his favor. Oh, I, I like these, like all these things, we are running a little short on uh, time now. Um, so I'd like to transition just slightly um, to, uh, we've talked about visiting Calpens National Battlefield, part of the National Park Service. It's, it's part of the Southern Campaigns of the American Revolution National Park Service Group, Kings Mountain, 96, 
the over mountain victory trail and uh, cow pens but uh is there's a bunch of other sites there's a bunch of other things that people can go um do you guys want to spend a few moments talking about some of the preservation um topics issues or successes that are going on in south carolina yeah Dan, think- uh, you want me to take cow pens and then let you take the liberty trail yeah sounds good Okay. Um, so Calpens becomes a, a national battlefield uh, in 1929. Um, you know, as early as the 1890s, I think it's 1891, um, there was talk about making it into a, a battlefield park. This is a, around the time when the, the, the battlefield park becomes an idea. Uh, places like Chickamauga, Chattanooga, then eventually Gettysburg, Vicksburg, Shiloh, and the, the Civil War parks start showing up. And then you start seeing that come over at Cowpens, Kings Mountain, Saratoga, Guilford Courthouse. Um, so Cowpens today is about 862 acres. Um, it became a national battlefield in the 1970s, whenever Richard Nixon changed his name. Um, and they do have a couple monuments there. The first monument was placed in 1856. Um, it's to the Washington uh, Light Infantry. It's out on the battlefield. Um, they were supposed to put a Daniel Morgan uh, monument there, but the Washington Light Infantry Monument, this was the 1880s, the Washington Light Infantry Monument had been vandalized, so they didn't want to put it there, so they, they uh, put it down the road in Spartanburg. Um, and then there's a 1932, the Calpins Monument was placed, not in its location today by the Visitor Center, but uh, placed closer to the town itself and then moved um, in, I think, 1978, whenever they were building the new visitor center. Um, So if you go to Calpens today, they have a great visitor center. It features uh, our American Battlefield Trust animated map, uh, which is 14 and a half minutes. You can learn about the uh, Rev War in the Southern Theater. You can go over to YouTube and check out our YouTube channel and watch that for free. Um, And they have a great bookstore, uh, a great walking trail museum, uh, Will Caldwell, who's down there, who was fantastic. Um, if you ever get to go on a, a tour with Will, um, Vanessa Smiley, who's uh, on these revelries and a lot of fun. She used to work down there. Um, so, you know, Calpens is, is great. And if you're going down there, Kings Mountain's just about 40 minutes up the road. So you can head up to Kings Mountain. Uh, as, as Phil said, that's part of the group. Um, and then, you know, of course, 96, you can head to the Over Mountain Trail. Um, so there's a lot of cool things to do, do down there. I think it's a well-preserved battle field they do some great interpretation once you go out there for the first time you're going to say to yourself yeah this is a rev war battlefield it's pretty flat um it's open you know it's kind of a perfect place here in the middle of nowhere to fight the battle yeah and one of the major efforts we're working on uh at the trust with our partners in south carolina i'm probably gonna get in trouble for not mentioning all of them because we have so many and if you're watching and you get to watch this thank you so much for all of your help uh but for t- in particular uh, the south carolina battleground preservation trust uh, we've been working over the course of the last few years on a project uh, called the Liberty Trail, which is to preserve and then interpret the critical battlefields of South Carolina, uh, as well as Georgia, to a certain degree, uh, during the American Revolution, that latter stage of the American Revolution, 1772 to 17, or 1779 to 1782. Uh, uh, so if you're interested in anything regarding the Liberty Trail, head over to our website, Battlefields. Uh, dot org. We've got some uh, uh, some that we're constantly constantly working on, but it's one of our major efforts. And if you want to learn about Calpins in less than four minutes, uh, you can see our own Dan Davis teach you about that in our in four video. Um, that may or may not have been shot at Calpins. I'm not <laughs> saying that that another battlefield may have stepped in. Uh, I think that's a state secret. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, and, uh, don't give the uh, behind the scenes uh, dirt here. We um, uh, but before we do. Um, uh, close this out tonight. I would like to thank both Chris White and Dan Davis for joining us here uh, on this Rebel Revelry. I'm not the only one that uh, is appreciative of the efforts. Uh, there were people that watched today that said they were on some of your pop-up tours. Um, they wanted to uh, give you kudos to that. Another job uh, well done. Um, people said we could probably talk even more and more about uh, Daniel Morgan. So uh, Dan um, might have you back on for one of them. Uh, love fest of Daniel Morgan. Um, but before we do close out, uh, if you like these revelries, um, we have them, of course, on Facebook. We have them on YouTube as well. Uh, but starting uh, now, we have actually moved into the podcast field. We have uh, all the ones up from 2020. We're moving on to 2021. And, of course, we'll uh, get 2022 up as well. Uh, so on Tuesday, we will make the announcement on our blog, EmergingRevolutionaryWar.org, on how you can listen to all this content, all free uh, on a new Emerging Revolutionary War podcast. So I just wanted to give a shout out to that. 
uh, before we end it here. But before we do close out, uh, any last thoughts, comments, questions, shout outs, anything of that nature, guys? I can't believe Colonel Benjamin Martin didn't come up one time. Let's talk. <laughs> I'm very upset because, I mean, that is where Morgan got his idea for cow pens Depends. and for walking around and making sure everybody knew their what they were supposed to do. <laughs> I mean, you know, just just saying, we, we missed a ball. We we dropped I'll, we dropped the ball. We there. dropped the ball there. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'll say this. Uh, we talked about Kings Mountain and cow pens coming so closely together, shattering Cornwallis's left flank. And this is something uh, – I think there's two roads that come out of those twin victories. The road to Yorktown starts at the base of Kings Mountain. Uh, Henry Clinton, the commander-in-chief, British commander-in-chief of North America, said it was the first in a series, uh, a chain of evils that led to the loss of the colonies in North America, worse to that effect. I think the road to, uh, to the reconquest of the southern colonies by Nathaniel Gr Green – that begins at Cowpens. And while those two roads sort of intersect, the road to Yorktown from Kings Mountain, the road to the reconquest of South Carolina from Green starts at Cowpens. Uh, I think they're two separate entities of, into and of themselves. And I think it's something that we should uh, try to focus a little bit more on as we move forward in our studies and scholarship. Yeah, there's definitely more to the story, and, it, and a lot of it's in the South, uh, the Southern the southern Theater. Those battlefields, which have been really understudied up until, I would say, the last two decades. Uh, yeah. Larry Babbitts has a great book called A Devil of Whipping, if you're interested about cow pens. He also has one about um, uh, Guilford Courthouse, uh, which is a great, great study as well. That'll put the two together uh, for you. So, you know, check those out. There's been some new scholarship coming out over the last two, two to three decades and kind of shining that light down there as George Washington gets his New York fever and just kind of hangs out watching New York for uh, just a few years. New York fever. Is this, that might be the name of a new, uh, I don't know, play or drama or musical, <laughs> New York fever. Um, but I'd like to wrap it up uh, uh, with one of the gentlemen that stayed on that third line at uh, Benjamin, uh, or John Eager Howard, excuse me. Um, got Benjamin Martin now stuck, on, stuck in my mind. Um, uh, of course, you can't go anywhere in Baltimore without stepping on uh, Howard, Howard Street, um, or battles and so forth. But Green once said that he had the great ability one of the best dispositions. And I think this would be the fitting for all what Morgan, the militia, the Continentals, um, that they deserve, uh, Howard deserved a statue of gold. You could extrapolate that to say that what these men did um, to destroy the left flank of the uh, British uh, thrust in Northwestern South Carolina deserved a statue of gold for what they did that eventually led to American victory uh, in, in the War of Independence. So once again, Chris White, Dan Davis, thank you for joining us here on the first revelry of 2022. We'll be back in two weeks again with a discussion with Brian Mack of the Fort Plain Museum. So we're going to head up to New York. I guess we'll get a little New York fever as well. So uh, stay safe, everyone, and we'll see you back here in two weeks. <laughs>